Thank you for being here. I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional First Nations territories of the Erie, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas, and the Chonodon of the so-called neutral tribes. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. Martin Parnell may be the most understated person I've met, especially considering he's a multiple Guinness World Record holder. And besides being a late bloomer as a runner, he is also a true humanitarian, dedicating his love of running and trying many physical challenges to having a positive impact on the world. Thank you to my brother Lyle for encouraging me to have this conversation. And thank you for listening. This is episode 45. What a thrill to uh, to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you, Martin. I've been listening to your books and reading your books, and my brother, as I mentioned, had introduced me to you over a year ago when I started this journey of creating this podcast, and he'd been bugging me. Yeah, yeah siblings are good. They they do things that way. So. That's how I started running. My brother challenged me to a marathon. So yeah. exactly. So maybe we'll just dive in. I have a, an intro for you, and I would be going on for many minutes if I tried to include everything. So I'll stop at a certain point in your story and then maybe we can pick it up and and take it from there if that's all right. Absolutely, Linda. That'd be great. Martin Parnell, you're a father, husband, grandfather, and brother. In 2001, you lost your wife, Wendy, to cancer. Almost a year later, your brothers challenged you to run a marathon. As a highly competitive trio, you decided to take it on. You strapped on your running shoes and quickly discovered how hard a challenge this might be. You were 47 years old. After you completed that first marathon in Calgary, you were hooked. You would go on to compete in countless other marathons and ultra marathons. You challenged yourself to the grueling Tour d'Afrique, which is a supported bike race from Cairo to Cape Town. And traveling through some of Africa's poorest countries, you observed how children were momentarily lifted out of their circumstances as they played a pickup game of soccer or other sports. When you returned, you created an initiative for Right to Play, a global charitable organization that uses the power of sport and play to educate children who are facing adversity, poverty, and conflict. You propose to run 250 marathons in one year, and raise $250,000. When you stood at the start line on January 1st, 2010, it was minus 32 degrees Celsius, which is about minus 26 degrees Fahrenheit. After five and a half hours, you had one down and 249 to go. Maybe it didn't seem like such a great idea. But on December 31st, you achieved your goal of 250 marathons and you had raised roughly $320,000 for Right to Play. It was a Guinness World Record, and that propelled you to achieve five more Guinness World Records by 2014. And you raised a total of $1.3 million for Right to Play. In February of 2015, a massive blood clot on your brain put you in hospital. You had to learn to walk again. And while in hospital, you read the story of a young Afghan woman who ran and won the first secret marathon for women organized by Free to Run. Always looking for a new goal, you promised yourself that if you could get yourself healthy again, you would participate in the second secret marathon. I'm going to stop there because there are more twists and turns than, you know, a drive through the Rocky Mountains in your life. And you've accomplished so much more than what I've shared, including writing three books. You helped produce a a film called The Secret Marathon. You participated twice in The Secret Marathon. And since that time, of course, we've all watched the horrific withdrawal of the US and Canada and all of the allied troops from Afghanistan and are watching what's happening there. So I'd like to be able to turn it over to you 
to share the rest of that story because in reading the book, The Secret Marathon, and knowing what had happened now, it was even more harrowing in some respects. So with that, welcome to the arena, Martin. Well, thank you, Linda. Yeah, it's bringing back some really difficult memories. As you mentioned, I've been to Afghanistan twice in 2016 Mm -hmm. and 2018, and there was a sense of hope, definitely a sense of hope, having run with the women and girls over there. The support that we received from the locals was amazing as well. And then coming back and supporting Free to Run, who is an organization that supports women and girls in conflict countries through sport. And it was an ongoing story. We really felt that we were you know, making a difference and things were changing somewhat. And suddenly within, gosh, it, it was really, it seemed within a month or even less mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. the Taliban you know, came in and basically took over Afghanistan. And I'd made a number of friends during that time. Obviously, I'd visited Afghanistan and we were in touch you know, fairly regularly. And then I s- start hearing from them help. We need help. Our world is turned upside down. In fact, I'd like to just read an email from one individual. And this is from August the 17th, the day the Taliban went into Kabul. Dear Martin and Sue, thank you for reaching out. We are okay and stay at home in Kabul now. These three days were the most horrific days of my life. I was on my duty at the office when they entered the city and we ran a long distance to our houses. When the gunshots started, I lay down on the streets. The tanks were coming everywhere. I sent all my documents and information to my contacts to see if there was any chance to get out of the country. We are safe now and we'll be updating you. Love you both so much and we'll never forget you. To receive that email just broke my heart and my wife Sue's heart. And we just didn't know what to do. Uh, We didn't hear from this individual for a number of days. In fact, it was a a week and a half. And then we heard that they were out of the country. And as you know from the TV footage, the just traumatic and heartbreaking scenes at the Kabul airport. And this family managed to get out. They were part of that. And they're now in the US and slowly trying to make a life there. And this is just something that is beyond anything I I could ever imagine. For me, even being involved in Afghanistan, I never planned to go to Afghanistan. As you mentioned, the reason I went was just because of the unfair treatment of of girls and women who were verbally and physically abused for running. And this, as you've pointed out, running has become really a theme, especially of my later life after 47. Running has taken me to so many places and meet so many people. And here is a situation where there was individuals I know who have gone through, which must be the toughest situation in their lives. And they're literally fighting for their life. I mean, it's as simple as that. And so, yeah, this is a time now when we have refugees coming from Afghanistan. The people I met have ended up, a number of them in Italy, in the Ukraine, in the UK, the US and Canada. So they've been spread out all over the world. And I'm looking forward to working with refugees coming to Calgary. And so anything I can do and we can do, I'm part of Rotary, which is a worldwide organization that that helps. And we will be doing what we can. So this is an ongoing story, Linda, right now. And we just hope that other people who are still in Afghanistan, I don't know what to say, whether they can get out or just survive, because I don't think it's a good situation. I think especially women and girls are going to be in for a very difficult time. The book was so full of hope, The the Secret Marathon, and I haven't had the opportunity to see the film, unfortunately, but just having the overlay of what has happened now was interesting as a a poor choice of words, but it, it informed my perspective when I was reading it and how much hope and how much joy those young women felt as they were having the opportunity to run. It wasn't as though they were freely able to be out in the open. There were definite issues of safety as they were doing their training and they were getting up in the middle of the night to run outside and sometimes were able to have someone run with them. But they were taking tremendous risk even at that time. I think what it 
and I've been thinking about this and, and the women I met over there and the challenges they faced when they trained. I think the word, you know, courage is sometimes um, overused, but it's not misused in this situation. These women and girls, and there was one in particular that I ran with, who when she went out with her friend, they were being physically abused, verbally abused, rocks thrown at them, attempts to be kidnapped while they were running. Uh, but they refused, absolutely refused to stop. In one case, the woman decided to go home and run inside her walled garden and train. Mm -hmm. In another case, two young women decided, no, we're going to run on the streets, but we're going to carry knuckle dusters and pepper spray. Yes. And I'm thinking, this is just beyond. This is just beyond. And I think for me, quite frankly, I was a little slow in coming to the understanding of what women and girls have to put up with on a global scale. It's I'm married. I have children, as you mentioned, grandchildren. For a long time, life kind of takes takes you up. You're busy. You've got a job. You've got the family. And it tends to be a little insular, I would say, for me anyway. Many people step out at a young age and good for them. And then I started getting into the running and the fundraising for Right to Play. And then I think the fog kind of moved away from my eyes, just what women and girls have to deal with. And it came, for me, it came through uh, reading about this young woman who ran the first marathon and and what she had to put up with. And then I started to see it more and more. And it just, it really, I think maybe part of it was when I was recovering from the clot on the brain and whether it's a combination of the recovery phase and just reflective of life and reading this story, it just seems so unjust and so unfair that this one thing of running, we basically we all have an opportunity at some point to do that. It's something we can do if we want to or not. But then these young women and girls who were being forced not to run by men, basically. And uh, it just, for me, it was just beyond. And so that's changes my life direction for the last six years has totally changed it. Hmm. So I'm going to ask you to step back for a minute, because I'm curious about someone who spent 25 years in the mining industry, had a whole life, obviously, the event of your first wife's illness and ultimate death had a huge impact on you. So, you know, for 47 years of life, and then all of a sudden, there's this massive shift. But I want to just take you back to even well before that of growing up as young Martin <laughs> young in the Martin. UK. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah. what was dinner conversation like growing up in your household? Yeah, it was pretty wild. My father was a butcher and, and mum helped him in the vegetable shop. So that was what our life, they had a, a little business. But I was the oldest of six kids. So imagine the dinner table, big table. We were in this old house, big house, and at the big wooden table with mum and dad cooking the supper. We were always sent out to play. It was called after school. We put our play clothes on and we'd all be sent out to play. We had a big kind of rambly garden and uh, I'd play soccer and the kids and the girls. There was me, three sisters and then two brothers. And then, of course, it would get dark and we'd get called to come in. So we'd all have to troop in and wash up and then we're at the table. And I remember a big bowl of st stew or it was always big bowls of stuff with six kids and and mum would make her bread rolls. And so it was, mm. those are the memories I have. It was chaotic and there was always stuff going on, as you can appreciate from having a 10 year old down to a one year old with mum and dad and then there was homework and different things so it was always lots going on but there was definitely a, a family of love there was you know no question and back then mum and dad were both very much into sport so more social sport but dad played soccer and cricket and big swimmer and mum and dad played table tennis and badminton and all sorts of you know tennis and so we all ended up playing sport but not for the sport where you've got to become on a team and you've got to go to the MBA or the NHL. It was nothing like that. It was, okay, you want to play some sports, we'll teach you some sports, we'll go out and we'll do it ourselves. Hey, and if you're interested in a team, that's great. If not, don't worry about it. So it's a different vibe in terms of sport. And that's always stuck with me. I must say, that's probably one thing that I just love trying all different sports. When I was 60, I counted up the number of sports I had done and I had done 60 different sports. <laughs> and so, wow. yeah, and, and, and this is just trying stuff. I love trying just different sports, different new things. 
I think the next thing I'm going to try is pickleball. I haven't tried pickleball yet, and that looks good. So I think I think that's something that sport has always been important, but it's the love of sport, not sport has to do this for me I, 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 or I have to get to a certain level. I've never had that other than when I started running it, that sort of kicked, kicked me in because I found I could run even at 47. And so that I did get a little competitive on running, but not too much. I, mean, I did three Boston marathons, but other than that sport, I just really enjoy it. And so that was definitely something that has come through over the years, I think. In your first marathon, you started out, you went, it's like, right, I'm going to start training. So you ran out in your tennis shoes and without the, in air quotes, proper gear and thought, okay, I'm going to just go out for a run. And, and well, this is going to be a little more difficult than I thought. Yeah, it wasn't, Linda, it wasn't good. It was not good at all. It was, <laughs> well, and it was because it was all spontaneous. I received this yeah. call from my younger brother, Peter, and then he basically challenged me to a marathon. And this was a year after Wendy died. And you mentioned about that time in my life. And it really was a time when things changed for me totally. I have two, at that time I had two older teen children. And so I was, you know, the three of us, but I was lost. I, I just, I was in a very dark place. I didn't know what I wanted to do. My job at the time wasn't fulfilling me. And so I think when I got the call from Peter, I was looking for something, I didn't know what. And I just said, yes, I'm going to do it. And then I, as you say, I dressed up in my tennis shoes and my cotton pants and fleecy top and toque and, and mitts and just headed out. And, and it was a snowy day in Sudbury, cold and wet. And I did 2K. That was it, 2K. And I came back and I thought, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. I've got to do 40 more K on top. So I thought, oh my gosh, what have I taken on? But anyway, I thought it through and decided, okay, I'm going to join a running club. And I joined the, the Sudbury Rocks running club. And that, that made a huge difference in asking for help in stepping out. I didn't know if I could do it. And I just said, okay, maybe you can help me. And that's something I've done ever since is ask for help as I've attempted these different things. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? Obviously, when Wendy died, was there was, there was no question that I was 47, Wendy was 46. And it's, we had two, two children and so on. It, that, that totally just changed my life. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do. It was, in fact, after that, I, I tried to keep going with the job and, but things were not, were falling apart. My two children, they had actually, they were in the process of leaving home with their partners. So everything was changing. And all I ended up mm. at home was my cat Lassie. And then that was I'm thinking, that's kind of crazy. And so I decided, actually, what I decided to do was that, that I needed to do something. And I had started running, but I decided to take two years off. And I quit my job. I sold basically everything. And I moved out to Cochrane, Alberta, where my brother was. In fact, I only brought three things with me. I brought a, a set of six camping chairs, a big screen TV, and a canoe. So, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but you, if, you only ever okay. end, if you only ever end up with three things, those are the, I think about what are the three things you would, if you sold everything, you would keep. Well, that's what I kept, the chairs, the the big screen TV and the canoe. So anyway, I decided to give myself a break and to just do things that were not totally spontaneous, but things I wanted to do. And you'd mentioned one of those earlier, and that was the four month cycle trip across Africa. And that was a life changing trip. At the time, you know, people said, oh, this will change your life. I said, no, I don't think so. But as I got into the trip and got immersed into traveling across Africa on the bike with this group of people, I ended up, as you said, playing sport with kids, table tennis, soccer, running. And I ended up, I think it was a seed that was sown, which led to the work I did with Right to Play and helping mm -hmm. children around the world through sport, learn new life skills. And so it's you say, what was the one item I would say when Wendy passed away? But there's been a number of steps I've taken that have led me in a direction as to where I am today. So it's a journey, I'd say, Linda, that's really what it is. It's not one turn, it's something happens, then that will lead to something else. But I definitely became more open for that after Wendy passed away and I moved away from somewhat of a, an established life with work for the company and the family and so on. So that was a big change, I think. And as you began to do these things, the word intuitive comes to mind in terms of an opportunity comes forward, or like you say, you read an article or 
you learn about a race. It seems as though you've just listened to what you needed to do next. I'm sure you sought out and did some research in terms of looking at these various races, seeking them out. But as I said in your introduction, there always seems to be a new challenge that you're looking for and, and, and seeking those things out. What about that do you think is important? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think one thing that I feel the way I've changed over my life is it's probably in the early years I was looking to, you know, go to school, go to university, get the mining degree, get the job. It was the type of steps and then do different things within the context of the mining industry, which I did both in engineering, operating and in human resources, which was interesting. But with the change and the decision to take that two years off, that was a switch. That was a different way of dealing with things and being more open to change and open to what's coming. So I think you use the term intuitive, using more of a gut feel than necessarily an analytical, which I tend to be as an engineer, somewhat mm-hmm. anal, and somewhat analytical. It's still there. It's still there. But you said it. No, I, hey, I wear it. I still, love my, I still love my spreadsheets, but I'm open to just hearing what's going on. And there's something which I've started to really live with is an internal compass, that's that when I hear something or see something, there's something in there that says, what can I do about it? Is there anything I can do to help? Which is something I think that I've grown into since Wendy passed away and running the marathons and trying stuff. So we talk about courage a little earlier. For me, in a sense, personally, it's the courage of trying stuff that I don't know I can do. And in mm-hmm. fact, it's one kind of approach I take is that I'll only take it on if there's a 50-50 chance of failure of not doing it. So it's not a small increment. It's, I don't know if I got a hope of doing this, but I think there's a chance. And that's reflected in the 250 marathons. I Obviously, I didn't have a clue if I could get to the end of that year because of sickness or injury or whatever, or even Mm -hmm. raise that money. I had no idea if I could do that. I think other examples, somewhat of the uh, the Tour de Afrique trip, was a big one, but that was a little more kind of, we had other people there, but I think the Afghanistan was a big one. When I read about the the young woman who ran the marathon, I had no idea if I could even get to Afghanistan, okay? And then run the marathon there and so on. So that kind of 50-50 chance is something that uh, I've taken on and I feel, okay, let's go with that. And it seems to, that, and, it, and generally it works. It doesn't always work, but it's been pretty good along the way. What does living a courageous life mean to you? I think in a way, what I've just mentioned kind of ties into it. That situation where you're looking, something comes along, so you've got to be open and you've got to listen to the opportunities and and you've got to have a feeling that, boy, I'd like to do something like that. But for me, it's taking that step off the edge and actually doing it and stepping forward and saying, okay, let's see what we can do here. And that's scary. I think that's something that I think kids are actually very courageous intuitively. I think kids just do it. But as we get older, I think we back off. We want to be safer. We want to not be in that uncomfortable situation where we're not sure if we can do it or we feel it's too big or there's too many challenges or people saying you can't do it. And I think that's something I feel we need to break away from that. We need to say, let's not judge ourselves. I think generally we're too hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we say, well, it's not for me. I'm this, I'm that. And again, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I think why we think that, whether it's through the media or whatever else. And I think we've got to say, okay, what do I want to do? What can I do? How can I help? Which is a big part of what I do now. And then take that step and continue on that path. And I think you talk about the 250 marathons. After 30 marathons, I had injured my leg and And I didn't know if I could continue. And I was devastated because I'd been opening my big mouth saying, oh, yes, I'm going to do 250 marathons and raise $250,000. And here I am 30 marathons in and I have to go see a specialist who tells me I've got a a leg, a hairline fracture on the, you know, on the bone in the leg. And I'm thinking, this is it. I'm done. Like, why am I trying? Why am I doing this? And again, fortunately, it, it wasn't that. It was a muscle. And I got going again. but 
this is the kind of thing that for me anyway is and has been key to what I want to do and as I move forward. And now, as I mentioned, I'm working with uh, Rotary and as a district governor and, and trying to make a difference uh, through COVID. Uh, we just finished a big End Polio Now campaign. And again, just trying to just trying to make a difference. And I think that's definitely, I think that's what courage is, stepping out and trying to make a difference and help others. That's for me is what it is. Is there someone in, in your life or in, in the universe somewhere that has inspired you? There's no, there's no question, and you probably won't be surprised, but I follow Terry Fox on oh. his journey of hope. And, yeah. and Terry was somebody who, when I was younger, I followed, and then I have followed him many times through film and books and so on. And it's just, there's an individual that I think epitomizes courage, epitomizes somebody who just did not know if he was going to make it or what he was going to do. And he did it with grace. And I think with determination and with courage. And I think quite frankly, there probably isn't as many great people who stand out. But for me personally, Terry Fox is the individual who is in the, is in my heart and who I think of. So a quick bio of Terry Fox for the listeners who may not be familiar with him, and I'll put some uh, details in the show notes, but he uh, lost his leg to cancer. He was 17, I believe. And he had been an athlete uh, his whole life. I believe he played basketball and he decided that he wanted to do something to help people who were suffering from cancer and help raise funds for cancer. It was in the eighties, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, he started his run across Canada to raise funds in, he started in Newfoundland, dipped his foot in the ocean and basically had a support van behind him. And he just started out. Nobody really knew anything about this. And as he got to through the Maritimes and, and he picked up a police escort and he got as far as Thunder Bay, I believe it was, and really caught the hearts and minds of Canadians. And one of the most painful news conferences I think I've ever watched was him on a stretcher, basically saying that he had to go back home to uh, White Rock he had learned that the cancer had come back and had moved to his lungs. And so he had to pause his marathon of hope, as it was called. And he died, I think, about six months later from cancer. And it was such a heartbreaking story. And it still is to me. I mean, he's one of my heroes as well. Yeah, um, no, it's Linda, you're so right. And it's just well, that story is timeless. And it's something yeah. that I think uh, anyone who reads that, I think they can get something out of it for themselves to help. Absolutely. Yeah. And his whole thing was try. Whatever you're going to set your, your mind to, you you just you have to try and, and make a difference. And he's made a huge difference. It's hundreds of millions of dollars now that have been raised in his name. Anyway, going back to your story, what would you do on your last day? Yeah, that would be that would be a great. That's a great question. So, I guess if I knew it was my last day, I would want to spend time with my wife Sue. She's been with me for fifteen years, and she is just the number one supporter. And she's from the UK as well. And I want to spend it with our kids. So we mm -hmm. got our three kids of Callum, Christina, and Kyle. And then our three grandkids. So there's Autumn and Nathan and Matthew. So I think on the last day, we'd spend time outside somewhere by the ocean or by the by water. For some reason, I love water. I'm always, I've always mm. lived close to either a river or the ocean or a lake. And so maybe have a picnic there and uh, yeah, just hang out for a day and just, just enjoy our company and tell stories. I think that's what we would do is well, the books. You mentioned the three books and I've enjoyed writing them and publishing and sharing them, but really they're for my grandkids. That's who I wrote them for. Mm. And my granddaughter, Autumn, she's going to be 18 in February and she's read all the books and we don't see her enough, but when I see her, we she likes to run as well. So yeah, I think it's just spending time with the family and telling stories and answering questions and stuff. So it probably wouldn't include a run, to be honest with you. <laughs> Ah, interesting. interesting. Yeah, I don't think so. No, I think maybe I run. Okay, so I have to lay the day out now that you've asked me. So maybe I do. I, I really love night running. So what I'd maybe do, I'd get up early and I'd put my headlight on and I'd run 10K 
and I'd run it along uh, the the Bow River. Okay, and then I'd have breakfast, and then it all then we'd all get together, and we'd head out for a walk and yeah, have a picnic. So that's quite the question, actually. Yeah, we would have a really nice time. So. Of course, I'm obviously allowing you to design it in any way you wish, (laughs) depending on your circumstances of the why that you would be passing away that day. But given the opportunity to be able to design it any way you like, that sounds like a beautiful story. Yeah, that'd be a good day. That'd be a good day. What's your legacy? What would you like it to be? Oh gosh! Again, it's it is geared to the grandkids. I'll be honest with you. It's I'd love them to to take from some of the things I've tried and for them to try stuff as well. And and I use that theme of try. And you mentioned that with Terry Fox. Maybe if there's an overarching theme, it's just give it a go. Just give it a try. And if you make it great, but if you don't, that's fine as well. In fact, probably my favorite saying is from Nelson Mandela, which is, I never lose, either win or learn. And to me, that just says it all. I, I don't really like the word failure, because I think it's, it's irrelevant and we use it as a cosh to hit ourselves with. But if you think about it as, well, give it a go, give it a try. And if you make it, that's great. That's fantastic. But if you don't, okay, what have you learned? What can you do from it? And so I think that's the, the key theme for me is anyone I talk to, whether it's business or whether it's rotary or whether it's through running, it's, you know, just try it and be good to yourself. And you don't have to do a lot, but you got to do something. So mm-hmm. doing nothing is not an option. Try something, doesn't have to be huge. So I think that's a legacy that I want to leave is, well, at least he gave it a go. And we can all do that. This isn't about an Olympian or about somebody who's won this or won that. No, it's not about that. It's about we can all do something. I I just want to bring back a a bit that we spoke about last time, which was your technique of running, which is you do nine and ones, nine minutes of running and one minute of walking and breaking your running down by those increments, as opposed to focusing on, oh my God, I have 42.2 kilometers to run. You focus on 10 minutes at a time. And it was something that you used to help the young woman you ran with for your first marathon in Afghanistan. And you helped her get through a marathon that she wasn't actually physically prepared for. She she hadn't been able to train as much and didn't feel that she was able to make it. And it really had only said, okay, I'm, I'm going to run 10 kilometers as opposed to the full marathon. So your whole technique from the very beginning, all the way through the many achievements you've had is really focusing on what you can see in front of you as opposed to worrying about the whole piece. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing I've learned and and it even started, I think, right from that first marathon back in 2003 in Calgary, I sort of learned not to look ahead too far. These goals, I talk about goal setting and achieving outstanding results. But the fact of the matter is that you can't achieve a goal in one gulp. Okay. And there's again, a classic line, how do you eat an elephant for one piece at a time? And that stuck with me. And I think it's exactly the same thing. I term it uh, chunking down. So I, and and I found this 10 minutes thing works really well. And I started using it in my running as I did the marathons and triathlons and Ironmans and then ultras is that these things are too big. And I think we, we all feel this. There's this huge goal and you're thinking, oh, I just don't know what to do. It's too big. And you don't even start. You, You don't even take that first step. And I've found that if I break it down into 10 minutes, whether it's running an an ultra or whether it's writing the next book or whatever, if you start off with, okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes and then let's see how I feel. There was many a day when I did the the marathons that during the 2010, when I attempted to run the, the 250, when, you know, I was halfway through that and I had done 125 marathons and I was tired and I had some niggle or some injury and I was in bed and I hear this rain. This rain is pounding against my window, okay? And I'm nice and cozy in bed and I know I've got to get up and do a marathon. This is marathon number eight in a row. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do? So what I would do is I would get up. I'd say, okay, 10 minutes, get up and get dressed and have breakfast. Don't even think about. So I would get out of bed and I'd go and get dressed and have breakfast. Then I think, okay, why don't you just dress up in running gear? Like you're not going to go for a run. Don't worry about that. Just dress up. 
So I just put on my running gear. And then I think, why not just go for a drive to where I started my run? But don't worry about the running, okay? Just drive 10 minutes and park up and then see how you feel. So I get in the car and I drive and park up. And then, of course, I'm in the car and it's still raining. I'm thinking, that doesn't matter. Why don't you just run for 10 minutes? Get out, run for 10 minutes. And if, if you've had enough, come home. So, of course, I'd get up. I'd do my 10 minutes. And, well, I thought, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm out there now. And I, and I would keep going. And I think this is, some, this is something we can all use in our daily lives. Whatever we're doing, just break it down. And don't think about the big goal. What am I going to do in the next 10 minutes? That's all you've got to think about. And it's the same with whether it's a project or whether it's writing the book. Once you get going, you tend to get into the flow and things seem to happen. But yeah, with the young woman who I was running with, she hadn't trained because of a situation in, at her home for four months. and But I felt she had the mental strength to maybe do it. And we didn't know. This was the key. We didn't know if she could. So the young woman and I started running and we did, as you mentioned, the 10 minutes and then we'd walk and run, walk. And that got us along the way. And she had the mental strength to keep going. We had a target of seven hours for the security cutoff and we came in six hours and 52 minutes. And so it was a way of work, working together. So with my background and, and the, uh, my knowledge of hydration, nutrition, that helped her, but her mental strength got her to the end. So it was probably, well, it was my slowest marathon, but it was probably one of my best marathons ever in terms of helping her achieve her goal. And that's, I guess, another th theme that I like to talk about is passing the baton, is sharing your knowledge with others so they can mm -hmm. achieve their goals. And that's a big part of what I'm doing at the moment. That's amazing. And then you went back in 2018 and ran again. That was wild as well. And that was, and that was a different experience. I went back because I wanted to take the, the books, The Secret Marathon, a copy of the books to the women and girls. And I wanted to run with the young woman who had run the very first marathon in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The books weren't ready, so I couldn't take the books. And the young oh. woman, she couldn't run because she was pregnant. So I'm there thinking, what am I going to do? Here I am in Afghanistan. And I ended up running with a group of young girls and women. There was eight of them. And I was a pace bunny. So a pace bunny is an individual who sets the pace for a run. So I, I could help them along. And yeah, there's a big story there. But I ended up running with the group and ended up running with two young women who was 16 and 14. Mm. And they finished the marathon. It was a trail marathon. And again, we had a time target of nine hours and we came in eight hours and 46 minutes. And so again, just helping others to achieve their goals. And again, using the, the 10 minute chunking down approach. That's phenomenal. And then in 2019, you had a stroke. Oh boy. Yeah. It was just, uh, totally out of the blue. I was shopping with my son and with Sue and uh, I was buying a big screen TV, the new one, because the old one died. So I needed a new one. Again with the big screen TV. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, and then I'm in uh, Best Buy. It's really weird. And suddenly I felt this mist come down over me and people are talking to me and I couldn't understand what they were saying. And I'm trying to talk and I didn't think I was, but I somehow I bought the TV. I thought, which is really bizarre while having a stroke. I determined. <laughs> determined, determined, focused, yeah. So I'm leaving the, the shop and my, my son says, there's something wrong and mm. I couldn't speak properly. Anyway, they got me into the hospital, into the stroke unit in Calgary and they started working on me right away. I couldn't speak for a few days. I had lost the use of language. And of course, then it was another journey back from the stroke. And again, so thankful for the medical staff who helped both in Calgary and Cochrane. And I slowly got back, got back walking and got back running again, Linda. And again, very fortunate. One thing I do share with you know people is that the best life insurance you can have is being relatively healthy. I mean, all the medical stuff is phenomenal. But if you can stay relatively healthy through walking or running or swimming or just moving, that's the best life insurance you can have. And so I think that helped me get through the stroke. I'm on medication right now, but I can still run. I can still do things. It's Yeah, that was a huge event, more recent event that I had. Just 
constantly in the arena of coming back from something, fighting towards something. It's, it's, you know, inspiring doesn't quite, doesn't quite cover it. So I've still got goals, right? So, so I'll tell you my goal for coming up yes, to the please. end of this year. Yes. Yeah, coming this year. So last year I decided to do a fun thing. And that was in the last four days of the year, I decided to do a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon and a marathon. So that's what's that December 30, December 28, 29, 30, 31, which I did. And I'm going to do the same again this year. So it's got a little fun challenge to finish the year. So I, so I figure if I can finish the year with a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, a marathon in the last four days, then it's a good start to the next year, you know, good start to 2022. So that's my goal from a running point of view. Amazing. Truly amazing. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it, but I'll give it a go. I'll give it a shot. Absolutely. You can, but try. You can, but try. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to have a five minute conversation with someone living or dead, who would that be? Ah, uh, that's a great, well, I like to speak to three people. Okay. okay. You're not going to give me just, no, I, I you're, can't. Just, you're well, allowed. Yeah. After the life yeah, you've had, you've, you're allowed. So, yeah. so I think, gosh, I think, I think Terry Fox is obviously one I would, I wonder, because just what we talked about earlier about Terry Fox. Gosh, I'd like to chat. I think, again, Nelson Mandela would be a good one to chat to. But I also want to chat with my grandma. Yeah. I want to talk to more people because you said that now. And I'm thinking I want to also have a more of a chat with my mum and dad. But let's just say my, let's say my uh, Nana Parnell. Yeah, she was a wonderful woman. She was at the age of 80. She still loved her Vogue magazine and fashions and stuff. And she was just phenomenal. I think and if I had to choose, I'd pick my Nana Parnell, I think, that I would sit down and have a, have a chat with. Because I want to know more about the family history and about her life and so on. So that's who I pick. Mm. What do you think she would think of the antics you've gotten up to in your life? She'd laugh. She'd just, she'd wonder what's going on, but she'd be interested. She was always interested in different things. She'd want to talk to me about the latest fashions. She would definitely want to know what's, you know, current. But we would just I'd say, we'd talk about family and different things. So I think that would be really cool. Hmm. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? There's so much more we could share, but... Oh gosh, Linda, that was, I think we've, yeah, we've covered some pretty interesting things there, things that I haven't thought about before and talked about. No, I think I just appreciate where I'm at the moment with, with Sue and I, and we're looking forward to visit the grandkids in Ottawa in December. And coming through COVID, it's been a very difficult time, obviously for many people. And I think the lack of connection is really having a huge impact on people's mental health and wellness. And mm -hmm. so where there's an opportunity of visiting and spending time with the family. For me, anyway, that's going to be a focus. As I mentioned, uh, district governor for Rotary. So that's been a busy time and that will continue mm -hmm. till the middle of next year. But I definitely want to spend more time with uh, family. We're heading over next September. It's, it's Sue's birthday. So we're heading over to England and our son is in Wales in Cardiff. So that's what I'm looking forward to. And, and I'll still look out for the odd challenge if something comes up. I'm never adverse to, to anyone got any ideas on things I could do. I'm, I'll give it a shot. So don't hesitate, all right? <laughs> okay, gee. Drop me a line. I'm always open to, to ideas. So uh, yeah, I think that's the kind of, that's the neat side of it is to be open, listen, and, and then give it a go. Are you still involved with the Secret 3K? Absolutely, yeah. So that's the probably the one thing that I am very much involved with and we have that event coming up on march the 2nd next year and so that will be going ahead obviously uh, we'll be looking to support the people of afghanistan in a little bit of a different way but it, we ran that virtual this year in march and we had participants in 23 countries around the world so we're very used to doing a, a virtual uh, event but also hopefully we can do some in person as well so the secret 3k is definitely something i'm still involved with and that is in partnership with the Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. Is that right? That's correct. So it's it's a group that we formed working with Kate McKenzie, the co-director mm -hmm. of the Secret Marathon film, and John Stanton from The Running mm -hmm. Room. And this will be the fifth year. And the charities, we support a number of charities, including Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan, also the Marathon Afghanistan, the Girl Guides of Canada, and 261 Fearless, which is 
a organization founded by Catherine Switzer, the very first woman to run the Boston Marathon. So that's the grouping we're, we're helping. And it, obviously, the way things have changed in Afghanistan, we will go ahead with the event. We will help them probably in, in different ways because we can't run the marathon of Afghanistan in person at the moment. But yeah. we are looking to help people on a humanitarian level. So it's going to go. We're not stopping. There's no idea that we're not going to continue because help is still needed. It's just we'll be providing help in a little bit of a different way. Right, right. Is there anything you'd like to ask me before we wrap up? Okay, so who has been your favorite interview so far? Is that okay to ask that? Oh, of course it was you, Martin. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just interested. Yeah, you've been doing this now for how long, Linda? Just, yeah, just over a year. So this is, I will have, as of Sunday, October 31st, my 42nd interview out. Okay, 42nd, that's 42 kilometers. That's a marathon. I'd call you've done your marathon. That's good. Nice, nice. Well done. Um, and I've done other episodes that I haven't released yet. So gosh, the favorite person that I spoke to, that's a hard one because the wonderful thing about doing this podcast is each person brings something very different and I grow with each conversation. My own perspective changes the opportunity just to sit and listen to the stories. And unfortunately, not all of the stories necessarily end up in the episode. So that's my job after each interview is to try and create a framework that leads the listener along because sometimes we have a few tangents that we go upon. Let me me make it easier for you. And I totally understand it's a very difficult question. I'm going to make it easier. Ready? So who would you like to interview? If you could interview... Anybody in the world, okay, living or dead? Well, <laughs> definitely Terry Fox. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, he would. Um, yeah, it would be. He would be somebody that I would just, yeah. It would just be so amazing, so expansive to have that opportunity. Thank you for the question. <laughs> it's not easy, is it? No, exactly. The tables are turned. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been an amazing conversation and, and truly inspiring. And I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface of of your story. And I would invite people to seek out your books, seek out your TED Talk and uh, your website and continue to follow what you're doing and support your fundraising efforts because the world needs more Martin Parnell in terms of the work that you're doing and the responsibility that you've taken on with your initiatives through the secret marathon and the efforts that you're you're making on behalf of women. I have to say thank you for that because it's challenging for a man to understand what it's like to walk the streets, never mind run, run at night, you know, and I thought, wow, yeah, running at night, what a concept. (laughs) And as a white woman living in a Western country, that is still Mm -hmm. something you have to always think about. Yeah. Your safety issues, never mind in a wartime country. I appreciate your ability to empathize and your compassion toward humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You know, I appreciate that very much. Martin and I purposely did not name the young Afghan women and girls with whom he ran for their continued safety. I am sure Martin will agree that we hope one day women and girls may express themselves freely through the joy of running and physical activity, no matter where they live. I will include in the show notes links to Martin's various social media, fundraising activities, and especially the Secret 3K run in March 2022. And to finish, this is one of Terry Fox's most famous quotes. I just wish people would realize that anything's possible if you try. Dreams are made possible if you try. Thank you for listening. Please follow or subscribe to this podcast. And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
become a member of the arena. Go to my website, thearena-podcast.com and click on the support button. It's so greatly appreciated. I look forward to sharing my next guest story. She's an extraordinary person whose generosity of spirit and love of her community makes her a megawatt force for good. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena. Arena.